In this video we're going to talk about entrepreneurship as a factor of production. Now you'll see from the bottom right hand corner there are 54 slides here so this is a long class. Uh, it's best to stop the class from time to time, have a rest, go away, do something else, come back and look at it again. Um, make some notes as you go through it. Stop the, the video frequently and make notes of the slides. So you've got a permanent record of what's happening and try to see it a few times. Try to, to watch it a few times. Um, factors of production. Well, in economics, there are four factors of production. Land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship. And we're going to focus in on entrepreneurship as a factor of production. So that's our emphasis here. Now the study of, uh, of economics suggests that we suffer from a problem of scarcity. This goes back to one of the famous definitions of economics before by Lord Robbins in the 1930s. Um, he said that economics is a science that studies human behavior as a relationship between ends and scarce means which have alternative uses. Scarcity seems to be at the center of economics. Uh, we have an insatiable demand for products as humans. We like to have more, more of everything, more, more, more. Um, why we're like that? difficult to say and of course not everybody on the planet is like that some some religious uh, people from different traditions may have uh, commitments to simple lives and they don't aspire to have a lot but for the vast majority of the people on the planet we want more we want uh, bigger houses and faster cars and more cars and we want we want we want so scarcity seems to be the problem our means of satisfying our wants and that's the really the the the, the kernel of, of economics that's, that's what economics is really about trying to resolve that issue um, before we recognize scarcity as important uh, we relied on theories like the labor theory of value which valued products by the amount of work that went in to make the product. So uh, let's say a, a Rolls-Royce car would be very expensive compared to uh, a, a small Volkswagen car. The Rolls-Royce takes a lot of people, a lot of time to make. So therefore, it was argued Rolls-Royce would cost more, would be more expensive. And it's when the labor theory of value was really replaced mostly by the work of Alfred Marshall in the 1890s. Um, when it was replaced and, and we saw scarcity as the, the problem, the issue, and that prices reflect scarcity, scarcity relative to need. So a diamond is expensive because it's scarce. A rolls rice is expensive because it's scarce. The company keeps them scarce. Many people want Rolls Royces, but we can't afford. So <clears throat> scarcity is at the, the center of economics. We require goods and services to satisfy our wants. However, our wants seem to be continually increasing. It may be driven by marketing on television or in the, in the popular press, or it may be to our own insecurity because we want more to feel secure. Whatever it is, we have this desire to want more. When we satisfy our wants for food, warmth and shelter, we want other goods, such as luxury household products. In fact, Abraham Maslow, in the Hierarchy of Needs, sets out uh, a little triangle showing how our our needs change. We satisfy our, our desire for food and shelter. These are our basic requirements. But then we go up to the next level when we have other requirements. And, and finally, we get to the very top where we've got everything. And we, we're self-actualized, in the words of uh, Maslow. The Maslow theory is looked at in other videos elsewhere on the course. 
In order to receive these goods, we have to produce them. And nature does not provide houses, for example. Houses don't grow from seed. We don't, we don't plant a house seed and it grows into a house. We have to make houses. We have to build them. So our want requirements have to be satisfied, usually through work. We have to organize the resources to try and make the products that we want that satisfy our needs. Uh, nature doesn't supply these. So we need to engage in a production process to satisfy our wants. We need to produce the goods. As I said, uh, the things we want don't just happen in nature. Some do, of course, food happens in nature. Fruit grows on trees, that's fine. But houses, cars, television sets, computers, the things that we, we use a lot of in our everyday lives, in our modern everyday lives, uh, we have to, to make these. Everything in the house, fridges, furniture, everything has to be made. There are different types of production process. For example, we could have subsistence production. Now, this means that we produce everything we require for ourselves. Subsistence means we, we have a piece of land and we cultivate the land, we grow our own crops, we weave our own cloth to make our own clothing, uh, we grow our food, as I said, we build our own house or our shelter. Uh, we're, it's subsistence. There's no division of labor there. We are just surviving. There's no luxuries because we don't have time to make luxuries. We just survive on what we've got. So we have to have many skills. For example, we must be good builders, farmers, weavers, engineers, and so on. Uh, we have to have many talents. Of course, that means we're not very good at any of them. The chances are we're the proverbial jack of all trades and master of none. We can do some building. We can do some weaving. But we're not very good ahead. We're just we're able to survive, and that's the essence of subsistence production. We're we're just able to cope. It's not a a very refined way of living. Uh, it's highly unlikely that we can be expert at all of these. So as I said, we're we just about able to cope. We we can build a basic shelter. We can weave some basic cloth, we can grow some food, we just about survive. So we're not going to have a high standard of living. Uh, in our society today, we have what's known as the division of labor. We focus in on do something and we do it very well. We have an expertise in doing that. We become an accountant or a, a solicitor or we become a, a doctor or a builder, or a plumber, whatever it is we become, we, we're very good at it because that's what we do day in, day out. We become very skilled at doing this job, which means the workmanship is very good. And we're able to do a lot of it because we don't waste time thinking about how to do it. We, we know how to do it. We have the skill. So productivity is higher when we don't have subsistence. We'll talk about that again in a few moments. Uh, in fact, we say that we would have a subsistence level of existence. A subsistence level of existence is when we try to do everything ourselves. Very basic. We try to build our own shelter, grow our own crops, weave our own cloth. Uh, very basic. Uh, can you imagine when it comes to bigger problems like medical problems? We can't fix those. So subsistence production is not an ideal form but sometimes in certain periods in history that's the way we have to live or had to live a second and more sophisticated form of production involves the division of labor and the exchange of goods the division of labor is when, as i said when we focus in on particular tasks and this was popularized by a very famous scottish economist called adam smith Adam Smith, in 1776, wrote The Wealth of Nations, 
a very influential book in in academic circles what Smith observed was that uh, people making hat pins hat pins were very popular back in 1776 ladies wore used hat pins to keep their hats on from stop them from blowing off in the wind so to put a pin through the hat and into their hair um, but hat pin production if one person made hat pins they could make so many per day but if if you broke the per, the production process down into small tasks one person getting the wire to make the hat pin straightening the wire cutting it the next person putting a, a head on it and put a point on it the next person hardening it and annealing it and the next one polishing it and so on packaging it if you did that the average output increased dramatically and the reason was because each of the workers had acquired uh, a skill and they became faster at doing that particular task of course the downside of the division of labor is jobs become very monotonous very boring people doing the same task day in day out but division of labor is typical in advanced economies we've got it in society some people become policemen some people become accountants some people become school teachers some people become plumbers as I said or some people become farmers it depends so we have it in our society in advanced societies it's typified by the division of labor most of us exchange labor for wages and we use this to buy the goods and services that we require so that's really the way the economic system works we we go to work we earn a wage and then we we spend the wage we've got or the salary we get and we spend that on goods and services so it's a it's a cycle the companies pay the wages and the salaries and then we buy the goods and services of the companies not necessarily of the same company of course could be other companies but it goes around in a sort of production consumption cycle this means that we specialize in certain occupations and exchange our wages for other goods and services it means that a school teacher who's very skilled at being a school teacher but doesn't produce doesn't build a home doesn't build a house or weave cloth and make clothing but that person's able to buy clothing they work as a school teacher they get paid as a school teacher and then they take that salary and go and buy the clothing or buy the house or buy the car or whatever it is they want so people work at one task but they're able to enjoy the output from people who work at different tasks working for wages has the advantage of security of income however there is a limit to the earnings possible so for example back to the school teacher the school teacher gets a particular salary perhaps every month but that's what they're limited to they can't go out and buy very expensive project uh, products they can buy products that are priced for people at that income other people have uh, higher paid <coughs> occupations and they can buy more they got higher paid occupations because there are fewer of those people and because there are fewer of them they're more highly paid scarcity determines their wage or their salaries the way around this is to limit uh, around this limit I say should say is to establish a business and produce goods and services for customers so what we we have is one group of people making goods and services and another uh, group of people who are making different goods and services but buying the output from the first lot and the workers in the first set of companies are buying the output from the second set of companies so we buy houses we buy cars we buy televisions and of course the division of labor is not national it's international we may buy a television that's been made in Japan or made in America or made in Mexico or wherever 
People who establish businesses are known as entrepreneurs. In order to organize and engage in production, four types of input are required. Now, these are the factors of production. But in order to establish a business, we need entrepreneurs. Now, these uh, four types of inputs are known as factors of production, and these are, first of all, land. Now, by land, we mean natural resources. We don't necessarily mean land, in, in, as in we look out and see a piece of land. We mean natural resources. Anything excluding labour. So it's the output from any primary industry. For example, agriculture, fishing, forestry and mining. All of those are classified as land. Just economics does this because it's, a, it's an easy way of just combining. Uh, these are natural resources, not labour, but natural resources. And we just combine them under the term land. All physical objects are merely transformations of primary outputs into the objects that we require. So if we think about it, land, being made up from agriculture, fishing, forestry and mining, that gives us the raw material for everything else, for the things we've got in the house, for the car, for the televisions, for the computers, everything. These are the, the physical objects that were produced. Uh, so agriculture gives us food. Um, fishing gives us food. Forestry gives us uh, wooden products, uh, gives us heating, gives us uh, all, all of the ways in which we use timber um, and wood. And mining gives us the resources of uh, different types different types of extractive products that we use again around the house or we use in industry or whatever it is labor well labor is the human resource there is no distinction between the various types of labor manual clerical and so on all are classified as labor so labor is labor we don't break it down under different categories of labor and then we've got capital these are the goods that are used to produce the final goods that are demanded by the customer typically capital is composed of machinery buildings and transport facilities these goods are not useful in themselves they are only used as a means to produce the final output that satisfies final demand so we don't have a uh, we don't have a demand for warehouses. Warehouses are only useful because they enable the product to get to the customer. The customer is after the product. It's not after the warehouse. It's not after the machinery that made the product. So sometimes we say those items have a derived demand. Uh, the business people have a demand for machines because it's derived from the demand that the customers have for the final product. And finally, we've got entrepreneurship. Now, the, o the other uh, three factors of production are inanimate. They, they, they're lifeless. In the sense that they perform set a uh, set of tasks in accordance with the requirements of the production process. So they, they're only used in the production process. But they are inanimate in that sense. I mean, labor is animate. Labor is, is a, a breathing factor of production. But it's inanimate in the sense that it's here viewed as simply an input into the production process. Uh, the job is specified and the worker accepts or rejects their involvement with that job. And if they accept it, they do that job according to the rules and what's required by the job. In that sense, it's, it's, labor is simply an input. It's a horrible thing to say, I suppose. Uh, it doesn't sound very flattering at all. But that's the way labor is. Labor is an input into the production process. However, for production to take place, someone must organize it and deliver the product to the market. This is the entrepreneur. So 
the types of companies we've got, the types of output we've got, the types of markets and what's on the market, all of this is determined by entrepreneurs. The price of the product, the amount produced, the style, the innovations, the changes. All of this is the product of entrepreneurship. And in that sense, entrepreneurship is animate. It's very much involved. It's very much animated. It, it's involved with it. Labour is is compliant with what's required from the job. The machine is just a machine. And the raw material is just the raw material. It doesn't do anything. It's just raw material that's going to be fashioned into something. But entrepreneurship, that's the fact of production that designs the whole production process, dreams up the idea, and delivers it to the market in the expectation of making a profit. The entrepreneur is the active factor of production in this sense. The person who anticipates the demand and who organizes the production. So the entrepreneur is very important as the person who anticipates the demand, can see a gap in the market, can see the extent of the market, and who goes out and tries to organize the production to plug that gap in the market and thereby, of course, generate a profit. In general, the entrepreneur will invest some capital in the business and will undertake some risk. But pure entrepreneurship doesn't involve the entrepreneur putting in any capital. Pure entrepreneurship is having a really good idea. And if the idea is very good, then others will want to be involved. They will want to participate. Production must occur before sales, and therefore the entrepreneur must anticipate sales when determining the size of the business and the type of production that should be used. You see, production takes place, let's say now, to satisfy a market in the future. So the entrepreneur is trying to imagine what the future is going to be like. And the future, according to one famous Austrian economist called um, Ludwig von Hayek, um, Frederick von Hayek, I should say, sorry, Frederick von Hayek, um, he said the future is unknowable. Um, the future is unknowable. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. So here are entrepreneurs working today, designing products that they're going to deliver in the future. But they may not be suitable in the future. So the entrepreneurs are incurring risk. Uh, they are they're taking on the risk. They're spending their time and effort in trying to anticipate what the demand for their product will be in the future. Not an easy task. So it means that the entrepreneur must undertake some risk. The risk may be simply in the time and effort that he or she is putting in to design, make and deliver that particular product. Of course, the entrepreneur will attempt to minimize the risk by using such facilities as market research and focus groups and try to get feedback and ask customers to imagine would they buy such a product if it did exist. They might prototype the product before it's actually made and, and show show it to customers and ask them what they think about it. They do everything they can to try and reduce the risk. But at the same time, they're working today to deliver products to a market tomorrow. And we don't know what the, the future is going to be like. As Frederick von Hayek said, the future is unknowable. We, we, we can't possibly have any real insight into the future and particularly the further into the future we look. However, there's no way in which the entrepreneur can remove all of the risk. Even if they do market research and prototyping and focus groups and go out of their way to try and get as much information as possible, they still can't remove it all. Back to von Hayek. The future is unknowable. Things do change in the world. Now the reward for risk taking are as follows. The entrepreneur has authority over the business. This means the entrepreneur has a greater degree of freedom as compared to salaried employees. 
you know, the entrepreneur can turn up to work at whatever time he or she wants or can leave work early or can move to one office as opposed to a different office or whatever. They have much more flexibility. In general, however, entrepreneurs tend to be very focused and very committed to delivering their product. So the chances are they're the first ones at work and the last ones to leave. The entrepreneur receives a profit. This is the reward for risk taking. You see, there are four factors of production, land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship. Now the returns to these are as follows. To land, the return to land is rent. So the more land or the more natural resource, remember land is mining, fisheries, forestry, and agriculture. The more involved, the more rent that will be paid to those. Labor? Well, labor is the the human input. Again, the language doesn't seem very, very nice, but that's the way it comes across. Labor is the human input. It's Labor is what uh, makes production happen. They're the ones who press the button and move the goods and package the goods and deliver the goods. And they receive a wage. Or if they're an accountant working in the office or a solicitor or whatever and they get paid by the month, they, we'd say they're salaried. Um, capital, the return to capital is the rate of return. And that's compared to the rate of interest in the economy. If the rate of interest is, let's say, 5% and the business has a lot of capital and the return to the capital is 6%, well, that's more than you get in the bank. So that's a, that's a profitable activity. If the return to capital was 4% and you can get 5% in the bank, then that business would be better off closing, uh, liquidize the, the capital and put the money in the bank and get a higher rate of return. And the fourth factor of production is entrepreneurship. And the return to entrepreneurship is profit, as said there. Now, the role of profits in the economy, well, the role of profits are as follows. Um, they encourage business startups. Uh, if we didn't have profits, we wouldn't have business startups. Uh, we need business startups because we need new products. We need more employment. We need more dynamism in the economy. So we want business startups. And the entrepreneurs who are working in this area will perhaps, they may have a very complex set of requirements. Profits might be one of them. They might have self-esteem or sense of achievement. But profits are important. We often uh, see people uh, who don't, I suppose, quite understand the role of profits and, and they're knocking profits. Profits has become a dirty word in, in some areas. But profits are important because they encourage businesses, they encourage employment, they encourage uh, newness in society. And we like new and reliable products. They also encourage innovation. The world's changing around us. Uh, it's been changing very rapidly in the last probably 30 years. And every expectation is that it will continue to change. New innovations, new changes, um, and it's all done because people see it as profitable to do. And of course, profits encourage efficiency. If companies are efficient, it means they have lower costs. Lower costs with the same revenues generates more profits. So in order to get more profit, companies will try to reduce their costs. More profits will result reducing costs. In other words, they have become more efficient. And of course, they encourage business expansion and business change. Because companies want to grow to make more profits. But they also want to grow and be flexible and change and produce uh, products that customers want. They're going to make a lot of sales. And uh, so it's, it's, again, bolstering up this idea of uh, dynamism and change and uh, 
evolution within the society and it's profits that's the motivator profits that are the engine for this to happen they are a good source of internal finance for um, future investment when companies want to grow they could go to the bank and borrow or alternatively they could um, save some of their profits have retained earnings and these retained earnings could then be used to finance future expansion they act as a measure of business efficiency well I've covered that in number three almost so but we can make comparisons and this is the unique point here in six we can make comparisons between companies in terms of efficiency we can simply look up their balance sheet see how much capital they have employed and see what their profits are and work out the ratio divide profits by the amount of capital and do that for various companies and we can get a measure of their efficiency we can compare companies perhaps completely different companies or big companies with small companies and we can work out which one's more efficient because we have profits divided by capital employed and that's a good way of measuring business efficiency there are criticisms of it of course now the characteristics of a successful entrepreneur well first of all entrepreneurship cannot be trained we can't have a college course on entrepreneurship and pretend to train entrepreneurs entrepreneurs uh, they're, they're complex characters we we don't know if it's genetic if if it's inside them or if it's uh, encouraged by their experiences their world experiences or worldly experiences experiences we don't know if it's uh, caused by uh, their, their education we, we're not sure what, what causes entrepreneur entrepreneurs but we're glad that happens because we get new products as a consequence if we didn't have entrepreneurs we'd probably still be living in caves it's as crude as that it's not possible to undertake a college course in entrepreneurship and then claim to be an entrepreneur um, some college courses are getting close to saying things like that but it's wrong uh, we can study entrepreneur uh, the entrepreneur as as a topic like we're doing here but we can't say when you've completed the course that now you're qualified as an entrepreneur that would not make sense in fact we can state that entrepreneurship is essentially a psychological state that enables some people to spot niches in the market organize production and exploit the niche commercially you see some people can spot that gap in the market not everyone can do it some people can look at product and think if it only changed slightly it could be used in this other way or if we combine this with that we'll get something which customers would really want they're able to to do this um, a lot of people can't do it there are new discoveries in science and technology coming out from universities and research centers all the time uh, many of them are not exploited for commercial reasons um, some are but it's the entrepreneurs who who exploit them who who look at these opportunities and then make them commercially available um, it's it's interesting to imagine uh, a world without entrepreneurs as I said we'd probably still be living in caves um, but sometimes entrepreneurs deliver products that customers didn't even know that, they, that the customers had a demand for those products nobody really demanded a smartphone before it was produced I think uh, Apple and Steve Jobs were, were the first no, nobody really demanded it nobody went knocking on the door and said please may we have a phone that can do the following nobody demanded a microwave oven before it was produced microwave ovens are very obscure products 
Nobody went along to the manufacturer and said, please make an oven that will heat the food only. And there's no heating element that we can see. or And it's, it's cool afterwards. And it's got all the characteristics of a microwave oven. Nobody went to a manufacturer and asked for that. It sounds like the person would be crazy. So sometimes entrepreneurs deliver products that even the customers don't know they've got a demand for them until it's delivered. And when it's delivered, there is a demand. Not everyone is alert to profit opportunities in the same way as the entrepreneur. And that's why they're so rare in our society. Uh, most of us can't see the niches. We can't imagine what the gaps in the market are. So we, we just take what's on the market. Sometimes we think if they had just done this, it would make it better. But we just move on. We don't think after that. It's the entrepreneurs who are making and shaping. It's the entrepreneurs who are making the products and shaping the way we live. The textbooks on the subject seem to agree that alertness to profit opportunities is the single most important attribute of the entrepreneur. So it's alertness to opportunities. And that makes it psychological. Entrepreneurship is psychological. However, many writers also mention other attributes that seem to be important in explaining the entrepreneurial phenomenon. Attributes like uh, leadership, motivation, and different, different characteristics. But the alertness to profit opportunities seems to be winning the day. Uh, it's having the ability to see a gap in the market and then filling that gap so as to generate a profit. That's the essence of entrepreneurship. And that definition was put forward by the famous, uh, again, Austrian economist Israel Kersner, who said entrepreneurship is simply alertness to profit opportunities. So amongst these are the following. Entrepreneurs have good negotiating skills. They can negotiate with banks and other institutions of finance to set up and with customers over the terms of sale. They're simply good negotiators. They're talented people. They know what the product is. They know what, what's on the market. They're aware of the gap in the market. They know what the customers have. They know what disposable income is. They've done their research. They know and they're able to negotiate from that position of strength. And they are skillful negotiators, by and large. They tend to be, as I said, very hardworking and ambitious people. Their ambition uh, drives them to work hard and dedicate a lot of effort in the business. As I said, they're, they're probably the first into the business in the morning and last ones to leave. They probably work weekends and all hours sent. They want the business to be successful. They have seen a niche and they want it done. They're very independent minded. They don't like taking orders from others. They don't they, they love to be in control. They're they they do not like taking orders. They're they're very independent, uh, generally speaking. So those are the characteristics of the entrepreneur. So in this class we've we've done a lot. We've covered a lot of areas, and that's what I said at the start. It's important to have stopped the video, go back to it, have a break, return, do it again, look over it, make your own notes off the video, stop the video on different slides and make notes, and become familiar with this idea of what an entrepreneur is and the characteristics of the entrepreneur and the importance of the entrepreneur, and look ahead as a factor of production and be able to distinguish it from the other factors of production. But that's all we're going to deal with in this, as I said, rather long video, but uh, nonetheless, that's all we're going to deal with. So let's leave it at that and say thank you for watching.